Thank you for coming tonight. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, as always, present here in the Most Holy Eucharist. We thank you, Lord, for the mercy that you have poured forth through his glorious wounds by his precious blood. We thank you how he claimed us at our baptism for the forgiveness of our sins. How he shows forth the tenderness of his heart, each of his actions of mercy, especially in the great sacrament of confession. Father, we ask you that in these days after Pentecost, you would send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to profess your name, to leave behind all that causes misery, to run ahead with great joy for your mercy and your love are the joy of our hearts. Let us entrust ourselves in the graces of this Pentecost, the graces of this lecture, the intercession of Mary, our Mother. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may notice that this packet is a little bit heavier than the ones before. I'm still going to try to keep it to 16 minutes. Part of the reason why this packet is heavier is I think confession is just one of the best parts of being Catholic, but also one of the most awkward parts of being Catholic, so we need to talk about it. I also just want to acknowledge that many of us have probably, hopefully, have had good experiences going to confession. Some of us have probably had rather not good experiences going to confession. It's also one of the few sacraments in which the person coming to it can actually mess it up. Right? If you come to church and don't scream and maybe turn off your cell phone, you can't really mess up Mass. Right? Like mass is just going to happen. But it is possible, like your role, my role too, like all of our roles together in confession. And most of us, especially if you're a cradle Catholic, have a second grade education in this. Um, so I'm hoping to at least get a sixth grade education by the end of tonight. Okay? Also, as you have noticed, there's confession literally available. So at any point, if you want to stretch your legs and expand your heart, please. We were hoping to have it available after, but the Holy Spirit didn't want to wait. So, The first thing I want to do with you is dive deep into Luke 15. If there's one chapter, well, there's a lot, okay, it's only the top ten, but like Luke 15 is like really have to get into your bones. Read Luke 15 over and over and over again. Th these are not surprise passages, but um, it takes a while to really believe. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. So before we even think about what we do, first let's look at Christ. He's different. When the good shepherd finds a lost sheep, I mean, he had to walk all the way in the desert, probably got a little bit sunburned. He's hungry, he's dehydrated. He has a right to sort of kick the sheep, be like, why'd you do that to me? Or you're never going to do that ever again. Rather, he rejoices and places the sheep on his shoulders. Sheep smell. Lambs are cute, sheep aren't. He places the sheep who has just caused him, he lost like two hours of his day, on his shoulders. And he walks her back. So many times, especially as Americans, when we know that we sinned, our, our just natural, like positive response is, like, I'm going to try harder. 
the good shepherd walks the sheep back. And then the good shepherd rejoices. So many of us have the experience of when people have to correct us, even if they love us, we know they're disappointed with us. Right? Like, when I was the troublemaker in the family, even my mom, like, my mom was a very good mom, but, like, she was exhausted, and she let that exhaustion through. Right? I think all of us have that experience. It's true in the workplace. It's true, like, we're used to, supposed to, like, we're supposed to feel bad, when we do bad things. And it makes somewhat sense on the human level. This is something rather extraordinary about Jesus. There's only rejoicing in this passage. He rejoices. And his joy is not enough just for him. He has to invite all of his friends and neighbors. Right? So I put one little joke here. Imagine getting that invitation to a lost sheep party. Right? Dog parties are weird enough in Manhattan. This is a lost sheep party, right? Jesus is kind of weird when it comes to this. And that he wants the whole, all of the angels and saints to rejoice. Right? The confessionals are filled with angels praising the Lord and rejoicing in your forgiveness. And just in case we don't believe it the first time, Jesus tells a second time, the woman with the ten coins. Again, this whole economy of joy in his forgiveness. And a forgiveness that he doesn't want to just rejoice himself, he wants all of the neighbors to come in and rejoice. So that's the first act of faith Jesus is asking of us, that he rejoices to forgive us. He's not like, oh, her again. Same old sin. Okay, Father, I forgive them. Ugh, right? Like, he is rejoicing. Now, sometimes the priests will say that. So, like, some, you have to separate priests from Jesus. Hopefully, priests are always imaging Jesus, but sometimes, right, bad apples exist. But to really believe that Jesus Christ himself always rejoices to forgive. The next parable, the third parable of Luke 15, is very well known, the prodigal son. I give you the whole text of it. We're not going to read the whole text. I hope that you know it very well. And again, you see the great theme of rejoicing. The father not only welcomes him with a kiss and a hug and a new robe and shoes and a ring, then he has, you know, veal cutlets for dinner. He has a whole party for him, right, the fattened calf. And it's, he's so joyful at his son's return, he even invites the older brother, who evidently no one likes, he goes out to invite him into the party because he just wants everyone there, even mean people he wants there. This is the great joy the father shows. But in addition to the joy, the prodigal son tells us at least one thing I want to highlight. There's other things, but one more thing to highlight. And that is that in forgiving us, God restores the truth of who we are. He restores the truth of our identity. The prodigal son comes home not feeling like a son, ready just to be a slave, just to be a hired servant. He just wants a crust of bread and a cup of water. He's ready just to be a slave. The father has none of that. He just says, my son, you are alive. And even when the older brother, where the older brother won't call him brother, just says, that son of yours, when all the prostitutes, right? The father again says, no, in fewer words, but he's your brother too. So when the father, son, and Holy Spirit, when they forgive us, they, they restore us to the height of our identity. One way you can think about this, one way you can think about this is when you get really in trouble, you get your whole name given to you, right? Joseph Martin Hagen. Now take that without the anger, and that's how God corrects us. He reminds us of who we are. That's actually much more like, whoa, I'm in trouble. 
when you know, when he tells you who you are, whoa, I'm his beloved. I'm his child. And I forgot. I think so many of us are raised knowing our sins in terms of just having too much fun in the wrong way. That's how, like, high school kids think. Um, Or just breaking rules. That's how adults think. I think it's more a matter of forgetting who we are. We act like someone we're not. And so one of the powerful ways that Christ heals us is just to remind us of the simple truth. We're his sister, we're his brother, we're children of the Father. But the older brother part of the story reminds us that there are going to be people, persons, who are going to um, want us not to feel like who we are. Sometimes it's our own self who wants to fight against this. Right? This is not a simple thing. Even when the Father says, you're my child, there'll be a part of us, the world, the flesh, and the devil will whisper against that. There's a little bit of a battle there. I give you these two quotes from the Psalms. I've used these recently, but I just love them so much. Psalm 25 and Psalm 103. Psalm 25 is our crying out, right? Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to thy steadfast love, remember me. And then Psalm 103 assuring us that the Father does not deal with us according to our sins, nor request according to our iniquities. For as the highs, the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. He, he knows our sins, but he sees us as his children. And he sees you according to the vocation he's given to you. And this beautiful line from John Paul II, he said at World Youth Day Toronto, which was somewhere around 2001 or two, I want to say, He says, we are not the sum of our weaknesses and failures. We are the sum of the Father's love for us and our real capacity to become the image of his Son. So again, to make this act of faith, Jesus Christ, you restore my identity as a beloved child of the Father. You do not treat me as a sinner, but as a saint in the making. You receive me not as a bother, but as a brother. Good. Now, anytime people talk about God's mercy, first, give thanks. Second, always remember that mercy always goes along with repentance. There's lots of people who talk a lot about mercy, and if you don't do repentance, it's like trying to eat Texas chili with your bare hands. You need a bowl, right? The same way, this great mercy of God Our repentance is how we get it in a bowl so we can actually receive it, right? And so on our side of things, as God is showing how merciful he is, remember the very first words of Jesus' preaching. Simply put, repent and believe in the gospel. These are just the heart. This is the heart of the gospel message, to repent and to believe. And certainly there are are intense moments of penance, initial conversion, Lent, Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, going to confession. But this should be our whole lifestyle. Not in a necessarily like dour way, uh, so we're going to work work on that, but this should be, this should mark our whole life until heaven. And that repentance is not changing, not just changing our exterior actions, It's also changing how we think. What St. Paul tells us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. To change how we even think about, right? um, I want to use examples that are... Okay, if I just have a trouble with eating too much brie cheese, I could... Repentance definitely involves eating less cheese, but also involves thinking about what actually makes me happy which should include more than just my stomach. Should change my, like, oh, maybe if I give myself to others in friendship, I won't feel the need to eat, you know, baked brie every night, right? If I, like, am generous to people, 
I'll actually feel happy, and then I can have like proportionate parts of cheese, right? Filling your own sin, I'm just using cheese because we all can agree that cheese is good, but you shouldn't eat too much. One of the great examples of repentance is the very end of Luke chapter 7. I give you the whole passage, but I think we remember it well enough. This is when Jesus is at a dinner party, and it's rather boring. That's me reading into it a bit. The Pharisees, you know. um, And then this woman comes in who's anything but boring. She starts crying on his feet. Right? Weeping, bathing his feet with her tears, dry them with her hair, and kissing his feet and anointing them with ointment. The party is just getting started. Right? I say this because one of the main takeaways from this passage is that people who don't need to repent just are really boring. And just, Jesus, I mean, Jesus loves everyone, but he's kind of like, just like, let's wrap up this dinner party, I got something to do later. And then this woman comes in, she evidently wins his heart. And it's actually kind of embarrassing for the host, right? That when we repent, when we're willing to cry about our sins, when we're willing just to pour out oil and like, get snot on Jesus' feet. If you want him to love you, do that. Right? That's how you win his heart. Cry on his feet. Show that just open heart to him. In this beautiful exchange, she has, she has, I want to say the words exactly as he says them, right? I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But to whom little is forgiven, loves little. Right? Also, the interesting thing here, too, is part of this passage is Jesus is revealing himself through this passage that he has the authority to forgive sins and therefore is praiseworthy. And so, in a beautiful way, the whole mess of this woman's life lives to the praise of his glory. It's because of her brokenness that he will receive praise. It's beautiful. It's like the ointment of her, of her love works to give him praise. I give you some more things there, but I know time, we're gonna, we have a lot to cover, so we're going to keep jogging through. I give you next here, uh, just to follow up Luke 7, I give you this beautiful passage from St. Therese. St. Therese uses a similar parable twice. I give you this one version. She envisions uh, a father having two children, both mischievous and disobedient, and when he comes to punish one, one of them runs away to hide, being afraid of his father. The other one runs into the father's arms, says he is sorry, that he loves him, and to prove it, he'll be good from now on, and he asks the father to punish him with a kiss. And Therese, a doctor of the church, says, I do not believe that the heart of the happy father could resist the filial confidence of his child, whose sincerity and love he knows. Sincerity might be a little bit of a facetious word there. I think she's being funny. He realizes, however, that more than once his son will fall into the same faults. But he is prepared to pardon him always if his son always takes him by his heart. This is the confidence and love that St. Therese has. That the father just wants to kiss you and just run to him and just say, I'm a problem, but you can solve me. And the father's going to be like, okay, you're going to be a problem next week and the week after that, but I love you, and I'll forgive you each time. And if you want to be punished by a kiss, come close. And part of this is because the, the very heart of what sin is, is our separation from the Father. And so to be punished by a kiss is actually a theologically rich statement. It's saying, I want to be closer to you. Punish me by bringing me closer to you. A.K.A. fix me by bringing me closer to you. You can think of that beautiful prayer from Padre Pio when he says, 
stay with me, Lord. And it, it, he goes through several iterations, and he says, stay with me, Lord, essentially, because if you don't keep me close to you, I'm going to fall. But if you keep me close to you, I won't. And again, that filial confidence, that confidence of a daughter, of a son. Father, if you keep me close, I'll be faithful. If I don't stay close to you, like, get me back to confession next week. Okay? Good. Good. So let's unpack a bit what the interior work means for both penance and faith, right? To repent and believe in the gospel. So I give you on this page just a, just a sense of like just being really explicit about it. Right? So first, to be able to examine myself, to name my sins, and to even just be aware of all the lies going around my sins. And then to own up to it. To own up to the fact that I'm responsible for my sin. And then to acknowledge that sin is hates me. I have a love-hate relationship with sin. I like to think, oh, I can get away with this venial thing that will help me cope with this issue and all this stuff. So as humans, we try to have this love-hate relationship with sin. Sin only hates us. It's not, it's, there's, there's, it's just hate, right? And to flesh that out, what I mean by that is that sin wants to destroy your marriage, your friendships, your vocation, right? It, it doesn't just want to sort of have you, it's not about having fun, it's, it's hell, right? Now, if I told that to high school kids, they wouldn't believe me. I think all of us have enough experience to know that even if the taste is sweet, the heartburn later is terrible, and it doesn't actually help your marriage, your friendships, right? Uh, and just to be really honest about that, and to own what that means for you personally, Right? What are the most important relationships you have, and is sin actually helping that or not? And also just being honest that um, sin promises things it can't fulfill. I guess my microphone's a weird place. Okay. Good. On the other side is faith. Faith, not just that Jesus Christ exists, yes, let's start there, but faith has a fullness to it. First, that he's Lord, and sin isn't. Sin can kick me around, but at the end of the day, Jesus Christ has all authority, honor, and kingship. And so even if I'm afraid of sin, that sin's going to rule my life, Jesus Christ rules my life. The pen is in his hand. And I believe that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, so, well, here I am. You found me, Jesus. And I believe that Jesus restores me, a repentant sinner, to my true identity as a beloved child of Father. He even makes me his friend. And that takes a real act of faith when I know how unfaithful I am. And that Jesus satisfies my heart. So whatever I was looking for when I was sinning, whatever way thing I was coping with, whatever thing I was trying to avoid, whatever it was, Jesus Christ is the answer. To really believe that. He's not just the judge looking for us to break rules and then put us in jail. He's actually the, what satisfies the heart. Because that's, in some ways, the very core of temptation. Is Jesus Christ enough for you? If not, then it's like the, the trench coat opens with all the different kinds of sins you can do to supplement and to believe that Jesus Christ has destined me not for sin, but for holiness. And so, yes, I will struggle, but Jesus doesn't struggle. He is going to accomplish his purpose in my life sweetly and simply. He's going to bring me home. No one is snatched out of the hand of the Good Shepherd. St. Paul gives us a little bit of a warning, though, in 2 Corinthians 7, that there is worldly grief and godly grief. Worldly grief leads to, um, well, it produces death. Whereas godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret. 
Think about that line, no regret. So sometimes we think about Catholic guilt, and I think Catholic guilt may have some okay qualities to it, but Catholic guilt might be more on this worldly grief. I'm going to look at the Irish, right? Might be more on that worldly grief side, right? So when we're talking about penance, we're not talking about, like, a self-destructive in, in the bad sense. There's a lot of nuances to this, so let's unpack this. I give you a list of four bad reasons for penance with a response to each one. So one bad reason to be sorry is to say, God really doesn't want to forgive me. His mercy is stingy, so I need to earn it. I need to prove to the Father that he should forgive me. Right. I give you the response. I mean, hopefully they're all like easy, like obviously this is false. Just only up the fact that we actually think these thoughts. Right? That our Father is rich in mercy. Ephesians chapter 2. The next one, this is more of like the, this is classic Catholic guilt. I'm a terrible person. I don't deserve to be happy. I, therefore, should deprive myself of any joy. Right. Now, I'm putting it so bluntly, I don't think we think these thoughts bluntly, because if we did, we would hopefully laugh at ourselves. But I think sometimes we do think these things. Right? Now, there are some truths here. We probably are kind of terrible persons without his help, right? So I'm not denying that part. And on our own, okay, maybe we don't deserve to be happy, right? And there are times we should deprive ourselves of joy, but the logic of those statements doesn't go in order, right? Because Jesus Christ calls us his brother. That's who we are. And if we're going to deprive ourselves of joy, it's because we want to be friends with him, and he deprives himself of joy sometimes. Other times, he's a, well, accused of being a drunkard and a glutton, right? And so having that little bit of a nuance there, God wants you to be happy, but the happiness he wants you to have is him. That's the real crux. The next one is, by penance, I can earn extra attention, love, and favors from God. The more I do, the more God will love me, right? This is like the middle child to try and get attention, do whatever it takes to get the attention, right? So first, just, and the, like, this is like a super Catholic mindset, like, okay, like, if God loves me fasting, then like, maybe if I just fast really intensely, like, three times a week, right? Um, God just loves you. Penance should be a thank you back to God, not a way of earning his attention, earning his love. You can get into really weird rabbit holes if you're trying to earn God's love, especially by doing painful things. The next one, again, I don't know if we actually say this out loud, but just to name things I hear implicitly, I hate my sin because it makes me go to confession. I don't want to be needy. I just want to be self-sufficient. So I will adopt whatever penances I need so I never need God or priests or anyone. Now, hopefully you would never say that out loud, but there is a sort of part of us, I think it's like the dentist approach. It's like, if only I perfectly brush and floss, I won't need to go to the dentist because it's painful. And confession is painful, like going to the dentist, which it can be sometimes. And so if I just am perfect and never drink Coca-Cola and never have any rock candy in my life, like, I just won't need to go anymore, right? And there's part of it, like, if we approach confession as a torture chamber and we want to avoid it, then I'll do whatever it needs to do to avoid it, right? That's, that's, a, that's a really bad approach to life, okay? So let me give you some good reasons to do penance. So, God has been giving me the love for which my heart truly longs, yet foolishly I have chased half-loves and false loves. God has been there the whole time saying, I'm here to make you happy. Why are you running around and playing hard to get with me? Right? So for millennials, I give you a Taylor Swift quote. Right? Sometimes we put God in the position of saying, you belong with me. I've been here the whole time. If you could only see I'm the one who understands you. If you don't know Taylor Swift, don't worry. Um, 
That's the one for good songs, though, so if you can look it up if you want to. For those who, who like sort of older resources, Teresa of Avila says in her autobiography, may God be blessed forever, he who waited for me so long. And then for our baby boomers, I give you the Stevie Wonder, Science Who Delivered I'm Yours. That's one of the greatest songs of penance ever, right? Like a fool I went and stayed too long. Now I'm wondering if your love's still strong. Now, if it's talking about God, it is. But we do wonder, like, could you still love me, right? I think about St. Peter when I listen to that song, which is a weird thing, I admit. But, like, listen to that song, think about St. Peter, and Stevie Wonder will take on a new, you know, force in your life, right? In other words, when I went and said goodbye, now I'm back and not ashamed to cry. That's Luke chapter 7, right? Don't be ashamed to cry. Just cry all over his feet, right? And to come back, not just saying, I'm sorry, forgive me, but saying, I'm, uh, here I am. Signed, sealed, delivered, I'm yours. Punish me with a kiss. I give you some more reasons for penance. I'll leave those for your, for your own prayer. Um, and you may be able to even add your own reasons for penance. But something that ultimately comes from love and trusting that in God's love for you. If that's not the basis of our penance, it's not going to go well. But if it's based on his love for us, then it goes well. Or another way to put this, if it bears fruit in gratitude, do it. If it bears fruit that's not thankful to God, that's probably something went wrong in the math. Okay? Good. Okay, we got to keep on rolling here. Good. So that's simply just the life of believing and repenting. But now let's come to the sacrament of penance. Okay? So penance is so important in our friendship with Jesus Christ that he instituted a sacrament for it. So we call it the sacrament of penance, because it's the sacrament that takes our sorrow that's usually a little bit imperfect, if not really imperfect, and it takes it and perfects it. So you can go into confession as a complete mess, but with some good things going on in that mess, and then he perfects it. It's also called confession because our main task when we're a penitent is to confess our sins, right? It's also called reconciliation, because it reconciles us to God and the church. So, here's where all of our Protestant brothers and sisters, but even us as Catholics, can question, why do I need to go to a priest? Why not, especially cranky priests, why not just go directly to God, who is always there for me? Well, the, que- the answer is, practically speaking, do both. Pray to God. Take out Psalm 51, go to your bedside and pray it, right? Pray for forgiveness. But also, um, since Christ instituted a sacrament and you're going to Christ to be forgiven, you should sort of follow what he instituted. Kind of makes, at least it's polite, if not just like, if you're going to come back asking for mercy and he says, if you want mercy, go here, then you should go there, right? That's simply, you can, there's like, that's like the obedience argument here. I give you that quote from John 20, uh, that Jesus gives the Holy Spirit to the apostles. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. The third reason here is that Christ knows what we need. We are not purely spiritual beings who only need abstract assurances of spiritual realities. Another way to put this is you don't just want to hear that God loves you. You want to feel it. You want to experience. You want to taste and see the goodness of the Lord. In the same way, we don't just need sort of spiritual abstract assurances that you've been forgiven. You want concrete assurance. Jesus knows we need this. We need to hear it in our ears that we have been forgiven. Okay? I mean, think about, the other way to put this is in the Gospels, Jesus heals through physical things laying on of hands, mud, spit. It's only, there's a few times he doesn't. Those are only for Gentiles. It's only for people who are not in the people that he does it long distance. 
because he won't enter their house. So if you want Jesus to forgive you long distance, it's kind of saying, treat me like I wasn't baptized. Treat me like a Gentile, right? But if you're saying I'm part of the familia, then get ready. At the very least, the screen blocks the spit, but like, get ready for a very physical experience, right? Jesus is saying, you belong to my family, and so this is going to be a physical forgiveness, right? That being said, the Irish took this idea and said, let's make this as private as possible. Like, in the Mediterranean culture, it was public confession. That's a whole story, right? The Irish said, okay, that's a nice idea. How about we go into a box and don't look each other in the eye and get through this together, right? Um, and, then, and then Europe heard about it. It's like, that's a good idea, Ireland. Thank you for saving the world, right? Another reason that Jesus wants your faith, that even a cranky priest can absolve you, and it's your faith in Jesus, right? There are moments that he's going to ask that faith from you. He also wants your obedience, Also, sins are not private affairs. There's no such thing as a private sin. All sin hurts the fabric of humanity, your marriage, your friends, the church. And so the whole church is kind of involved. This time it's just one person, though, so it's kind of nice, just the priest. And also, Christ's joy in forgiving you is not private. In Luke 15, each time, Jesus invites the whole neighborhood in to forgive you, Luckily, you just invite the priest in to rejoice, right? But God wants there to be joy in the whole family when you're being forgiven, okay? And I think the priest will come back later at 7.30 if you're waiting for confession. So, yeah, good. Okay, keeping jogging. So, some common mistakes in preparing for confession. First, I just want to make, before I even start this passage, this is not me correcting you. This is a kind of a weird thing as a priest telling you mistakes that people make. I also go to confession, so these are the mistakes I make too. So I'm going to be very clear about that. This is not some sort of passive-aggressive, like I've been waiting for my chance to tell you all the mistakes you've been doing this whole time, right? Okay? So I go to confession very regularly, and I make lots of mistakes. Okay? So one very common mistake is that we can simply focus on naming our sins, but without stirring up holy sorrow and desire to amend our lives. Now, confession still works, as long as there's a little bit of sorrow and a little bit of amendment. But what's really powerful, most of us, uh, certain, by your mid-20s, you know your five sins. And sometimes there's an exciting one that happens, but usually it's the same five sins. You don't need to think hard about how to name them. But it's really important is to really stir up that contrition. It says, Jesus, I'm really, I love you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. I love you. That needs to get some time, right? Again, for my millennials here, that's Taylor Swift. We are never, ever, ever getting back together, okay? Just having that, like, no, I'm not picking that phone. I'm not going to look at you up on Facebook. We're done, okay? That's really important to cultivate. That sort of like, I'm never going back. And I love you, Jesus. Another thing is that we can approach, we can just get fixated on our sinfulness and actively doubt God's love. Now, if you're actively doubting God's love, just confess that. But as best as you can, to like stir up your faith. Jesus, I believe you can love me. Jesus, I am not so special that I am the one person in all of creation you can't love. To really just stir, you need, and not just like sort of think it, but to really lean into that. Really believe that God could love you. Again, read Luke 15. Pray Psalm 103. To put time into that. Another possible error is needing to confess every possible venial sin. Um, now, there's something good there. We want to be thorough. Um, and sometimes there, like, we, I want to be sensitive because sometimes there are, there's things going on, right? Um, but so I, I say that if, if it distracts me from spending time loving Jesus and I'm just sort of like doing like 
like a sort of like a vacuum cleaning OCD thing, just trying to get every, if I'm like Lady Macbeth, out damn spot, and just like sort of rubbing this spot this whole time, and not looking to Jesus and how much he loves me, like, so if I'm, if I'm getting Lady Macbeth about my venial sins, I should back up, back away a little bit, okay? Another thing on the opposite side of this is, okay, I'm ready to acknowledge my mortal sins, but I'm not really going to name them straightforwardly. I'm not going to count them, right? We're going to talk about this later. No one's going to be happy when I do this, okay? When I go to confession, I'm dodgy, okay? We're going to explain that later. Another one is just to go in and say, I'm feeling bad about this thing. And it's like, okay, well, like, what sin am I really sorry for? Right? If I'm just feeling bad about how poor our two presidential candidates are, and they, these are the two options we have, and I just need to talk to someone about it, that's called friendship. Like, go to a friend, have coffee, and be like, these are our two options, right? Um, but if I'm actually confessing anger at one of the candidates, then just name it. And don't blame the candidate. To blame yourself for being angry, okay? Sometimes you just go in, like, I'm feeling sad about things. It's like, okay, are you feeling sad about your sins, and can you name that sin you're feeling sad about? good. And this is just in, in the big picture, just welcome the Holy Spirit to show you what are perhaps like the pivotal sins in your life, right? Uh, sometimes we get so focused on this one area that's going poorly, and it's good to confess that area. Yes, 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 yes. But perhaps God's trying to get you to realize like the taproot beneath it. It's like, these dandelions keep, keep growing. I keep ripping off the dandelion heads. Why do they keep growing? Like, maybe the Holy Spirit wants to bring you to a place of showing you where the taproots are and help you get... Sometimes the taproots are just really small venial sins. So at the very least, when you're making your act of... You're making your examination of conscience, say, Holy Spirit, enlighten my mind. Help me to see what's beneath this. What you want me to confess. Right? If nothing comes, don't force it. But just be open to that. Be open to the Holy Spirit revealing the tap roots. Good. So, my apologies to those who are confession pros. I'm going to aim at second grade preparation for confession and work up. Okay? So, beginning of the confession, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been how many long since my last confession? And I am blank, blank, blank. This is not necessary, but it's very helpful. Okay, all you have to do is begin with a sign of the cross, and we're into it, okay? Uh, for length of time, you don't need to be exact. The priest wants to know whether it's been one day or 40 years or somewhere in the middle, right? And so some people will, like, take 30 seconds to say whether it was seven or eight days. It's like, okay, I, I got it, I got it, I got it, okay? Because, like, as a priest, you will hear a two-day confession and then a 40-year confession, you sort of want to know, okay, like where, like we're talking about years, decades, months, weeks, days, hours, okay? Saying your state of life is not necessary, but it's very helpful. First, the priest doesn't just give you counsel that's completely not related to you, but also there are some sins that change with your state in life. So if a, if a man confesses kissing his girlfriend, it matters if he's single if he's married to another woman or he's a priest. Those are very different kinds of kisses, okay? Also, sometimes, this is rather rare, but sometimes the priest just can't know by the voice if it's a man or a woman. And so sometimes it's just nice to give you some context clues because you don't want to, like, say, you are a daughter of God. And like, Father, <laughs> my voice is high. <laughs> right? Um, good. If you know the priest well enough and you want personal counsel, you can say your name. You don't have to. Um, and you don't, please don't feel any pressure. But like, especially if you're confessing a sin that everyone hates me. And you're like, I know you. People like you. That actually can like be helpful. Okay? Good. So confessing your sins. sins. Now this microphone's weird. So you must, again, you already know this, but just say it. 
you must confess each mortal sin since your last confession. Name and number them. Give any details that change the nature of the sin. And then you can confess venial sins. No details are needed. And I suggest summarizing them and naming the root. You can confess mortal sins that you forgot to confess in your previous confession. You also can renew your, conf- your sorrow for all your previous sins. Right? For these sins, any sin I'm forgetting, all the sins of my past, I am sorry. Especially if like, something caught you. Like, like, if you had a moment where you're like, I've been a jerk to my spouse this whole time. So you confess the sins of being a jerk since your last confession, but then just renew your contrition for like all the ways I've just been mean to my spouse. I'm sorry. Right? This is a sort of a way of letting God clean it all up. Okay? I recommend any with a concluding statement, like for these sins, for any sin I'm forgetting, all sins of my past, I'm sorry. Something in that ballpark. Sometimes the priest doesn't know if you're done or not which either is going to make a really long, awkward silence or an awkward interruption. And so it's helpful to let the priest know, I'm done. And you could just say, I'm done, but it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit better to say, like, for all these sins, I'm sorry. Okay. Here are some general principles in naming your, in confessing your sins. First, name the sin. Right? This is a matter of just self-knowledge and responsibility. Right? So if you're vague, I was impure, then it's just going to get awkward because the priest is going to have to ask you, like, what did that mean, right? And that's a good way of putting it. It's possible the priest will say something even more awkward, right? Did you do this? And like, whoa, I didn't even know that was possible, right? Um, so if you name it, it's just going to go a lot better. Be careful about circumlo- circumlocutions. Like, I'm struggling with this, or I did not live up to the standard. So it's like, just say, I did this sin, and I'm sorry. Um, also, some people will try to hide the big sin in a long list of little sins. It still works, but it's like, it's kind of like a fifth grade tactic. Like, just, let's just own it up to it, right? Honestly, sometimes if you need the big sin first and then give a list of all your other sins, <laughs> priests are men and men don't always remember. They're like, they confess something in the beginning. I forget what it was. Okay, God loves you. <laughs> so I always suggest leading off with it and then hope the, the priest is a man and forgets. Okay? The next one is take responsibility for your sins. If you're confessing something, it's because you did it. Right? Uh, so please don't blame others for your sins. Especially, like, one real pothole is if you're confessing anger. If, if I'm confessing anger... Say, Father, I was angry this past week. And here are all the reasons why I was angry. And as I'm going through the reasons why I'm angry, I'm getting more angry. I can't believe that person's such a jerk. Like, that, okay, it works for confession, but is it helpful to rehearse why you're angry at this person instead of just confessing the anger and saying, I should be better. It's my fault I was angry. Okay. If it's not my fault, then I'm just having righteous anger, or I think it's righteous anger, in which case it's not a sin, or I'm confused about whether it's a sin or not. Right? And so as best as I can, I should avoid naming other people's sins. Now there's sometimes, there are certain situations where you have to imply it, but at the very least, it should not be a focus. It should not get 95% of the confession with like a 5% and I did this. Right? Okay? The next one is just to be sorry for your sins. There are some times that you want the priest to like you. I already do like you. That's, you can know that for sure. But sometimes you really want the priest to like you because you feel all the shame, which is understandable. And then you start giving the Catholic resume. Like, I'm a good person, Father. Right? Like, my aunt is a lecturer on Long Island. Right? Like, they do the collection every week. Right? Um, it's a little bit, right? Like, um, but you're forgiven not because you're good, but because Christ is good. So just be sorry for the sins. Similarly, sometimes um, we, we, we want to, like, Father, you need to forgive me because I'm going to try harder. I'm just so good at trying hard. I'm just never going to sin because I'm so good at trying hard, Father. I'm a Pelagian, Father. I'm really good, right? Instead, just seek God's help. 
to say, these are my sins, and I'm a mess, who, I need God, right? Um, now, that, you don't even have to say anything there, but I just want to name that, because as Americans, we just have this, like, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to go out and get a coffee with a shot of espresso, and I'm not going to do this ever again, right? Rather, Jesus Christ and his precious blood, that's the reason why I won't, I won't do it again. One sensitive area, a delicate matter, is how much detail to give. This is a very delicate thing, so I'm just going to give you some ideas, but like, yeah, sometimes, yeah, do what you think is best as adults. So focus more on mortal sins and venial sins, okay? Um, Focus more on the concrete acts of sins rather than general habits of sin. It still works if you say, like, I'm proud, I'm vain, I'm a glutton, da-da-da-da-da, forgive me, right? But it's better to say, like, I did this act of pride, or I did this act. Um, it's just pick, like, the big ones from the past, the big cobwebs, and name the concrete acts, right? Now, that's a danger thing, because don't tell the story of it, but name it in a sentence or two. That sort of gives more... Um, Right? Because pride covers every possible sin. So if someone says, I'm proud, it's like, okay, that's definitely true. It gives me no specific detail about what's going on. Every sin is a sin of pride, right? At least that's how, that's how Dominicans think, okay? But if you do add details, your details should expose your culpability and not excuse your culpability. So don't give details to say, I did this sin, but it wasn't a big deal. Say, I did this sin, and I should have known better, whatever it was, okay? And again, don't confess other people's sins. I put it twice on this handout so you can imagine why. And when in doubt, give fewer details. Those are just general rules, general principles, but I sort of give them to you as adults. So, like, think through your confession, okay? Also, just be aware of the different types of confessions, and be aware of the circumstances. AKA, if there's a line behind you, keep it moving. The priest doesn't know if there's a line or not. So like sometimes the priest is like, right? Some priests are always like that. Some priests don't know there's a line and they're thinking, oh, I have time to go through this question of the Summa with you essentially, right? So the standard parish confession should be rather a straightforward confession without like going through huge spiritual council questions. Now, if you have spiritual counsel questions, raise those outside confession, okay? Then you have the spill the beans confession, and that's when you need longer time. And you may also want to pick your priest for that. You may want to pick the priest you want to spill the beans with. And this is like saying, can I go to confession with you and give you all the details? Because I just need it, right? I just need to tell you the story. I know in the parish line, I shouldn't tell you a whole story behind each sin, but like, I'm in a state in life right now, I just need to spill the beans, right? Because think about it this way. If you take a 15-minute confession in line, that's a really long confession. If you ask a priest for a 15-minute meeting, that's a really short meeting, right? Just keep it 15 minutes, though, right? Then there's also super quick sacrilege-preventing confessions. So if it's like right before Mass, and you, you're in a situation where you're going to receive communion, and you just like, don't want, you know, just make sure it's a really quick lightning confession, right? So if you're getting a priest right before Mass, and he's, like, trying to vest, and you're like, Father, I need you to hear my confession, then it better be, like, I'm sorry for this sin, here's my mortal sin, I'm sorry for my sins. Just like, right? Okay? There's also regular confessor confession. So one way is just to go to the same priest and invite him to sort of use all of his knowledge of who you are to give you counsel, right? To say, like, hey, this is Mary, and I welcome you to use all of your knowledge about me to, like, help me. Not, yeah, um, right? Okay, good. The last two confessions are hopefully very rare, but I want you to be ready for them. So one is a hospital confession. So if you go to the hospital, please, like, there's priests here to hear a confession. It's going to have to be quick because nurses and everyone's coming in and out. But it's, because if you go, if you're in the hospital and you want anointing of the sick, the priest is going to ask you to go to confession first. 
just be ready. Um, I went to a man who was dying. His sister was a religious sister, and so he knew what he was doing. So as soon as I came in the room, he asked everyone to leave. Right, just like, just be ready for that, okay? The final, which hopefully you only have once, is a deathbed confession. First, pray that you can go to confession on your deathbed. That's a good thing to ask Mary, right? You just, just want to have just complete forgiveness at the end. And make sure your family knows, or whoever's your caretaker, you want confession before you lose the ability to confess. Right? One common problem is that the priest is called in only after the person can't talk anymore. And so if you're like a, if you're the kind of person who goes to a parish, you know, parish study, the priest can give you absolution, because they're like, okay, like, they would want to go to confession. But for someone who hasn't gone to confession in 40 years, the priest doesn't have the authority just to give absolution willy-nilly, right? So for yourself and for your loved ones, when they're on, when, when death is coming close, don't wait to get the confession heard, okay? That's one of the greatest things we do, is to make sure our loved ones get confession. The next thing here is a little guide specifically about confessing sexual sins. This is the area of the most awkward things. We're pretty good at confessing other kinds of things. This is where things get weird. It's also the most important place of getting healing. This is why confession is so important. It actually can bring healing to these areas. So a couple principles here. First, sins are to priests as diseases are to doctors. So if I go to a doctor and I have a weird rash, because Irish people have weird skin, and I'm like, oh, he's going he's gonna to like really wince when he sees this, and he's going to throw me out of the office. He's going to be like, oh, that's da 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 Oh, here's the cream for that, right? It's, I've seen that, and he's going to, you know, weird handwriting. In the same way, priests, at least a good priest, is going to be very professional, and he's probably not going to be surprised. I've only been in priest three years, and I've had, I can't even, okay, maybe one or two confessions actually surprised me this whole time. In fact, it's kind of surprising if you don't hear something in the Sixth Commandment zone. You sort of trust the person. Like, okay, I guess nothing happened there, right? But it's, you're not going to, most, 99% surety, you're not going to surprise the priest with any of these sins. As always, simply name the sin and say how many times you committed it. So again, don't be vague. I did something with my girlfriend. That could be anything, right? You could rob a bank together, um, right? And if you put the priest in a situation where he has to ask clarifying questions, it's only going to get more awkward, right? I suggest using technical terms and not colloquialisms for sins. Uh, there was one time, it, it was a Spanish speaker trying to go into English, and there was a colloquialism that I only realized halfway through, oh, that's what we're talking about. So uh, luckily, nothing awkward happened in that confession, but just say the word, and it's a lot clearer, less awkward ability, okay? It's also just a sign of self-respect, just to name it, I think. On the other side of not being too vague, uh, avoid being too graphic. So don't tell the whole story. In fact, please don't. I suggest seven words or less, if you can do it, okay? So just think it through, seven words or less. That's a principle. If you need more words, go for it. And one common area where lots of words are used, if something's in a gray zone, right? If it's just simply fornication, that's straightforward. If it's simply masturbation, that's straightforward. But if it's something that's sort of like, it was kind of that, but it didn't get all that way, and then you try to explain exactly where it was, I suggest giving the upper limit. So saying like, you know, I was, what did I put here? I was too intimate with my girlfriend. We didn't sleep together, but I knew I was putting us in the near occasion. That, that's, I think that helps. Just like say, okay, we didn't do this, but we got close to it. And that sort of puts it in the right framework, and hopefully the priest won't ask for any more details. Right? Sometimes, especially after sins that cause us shame, uh, there's a tendency, at least my own tendency, of, I'm a people pleaser, so I want to please the priest, so I will then go on to tell them all these good things, just to make them feel good, right? Um, 
Instead, if you, so if you feel the need just to like quickly change the subject after an awkward sin, always change the subject to Jesus. So say, and I know Jesus loves me, and he's a good friend. So if you have to, like, because that's the understandable, it's a really awkward kind of sin. And so if you have to pivot, pivot to Jesus and talk about him, okay? One particular sort of nuance here, what happens if you actually liked the sexual sin? What are you supposed to do then? Because that's, like, the reason why we do those sins, because there is, like, pleasure involved, right? So, first, go to confession. That's the uh, ultimate thing here. You just need a bit of sorrow and a bit of resolution to change, right? Then that's the minimum, so please don't aim for the minimum. But if that's all you've got, that's all you've got. Please go. You do not need to hate the partner, but you may want to reassess whether this is a good relationship or not. You don't need to hate the pleasure, or even like the relationship. Like, like you don't need to be like, oh, like everything we do is sinful now, right? Um, but you need to say, God, you have the love that actually truly satisfies me, right? And again, we often go to confession as a hot mess, and God puts us right. So don't try to put things right and then go to confession. Go to confession as soon as the Holy Spirit tugs your heart. Okay? So that's a very sensitive area, um, but hopefully it's a little bit of clarity. You're not going to tell second graders these things, right? So welcome to sixth grade education. Okay, the priest's counsel. So hopefully the priest tells you how much God loves you and convinces you to leave all sin behind, to follow God with your whole heart, right? So priest's words can bring Christ's wisdom and healing or not. <laughs> Sometimes the priest misunderstands us and we just have to endure this part, okay? Let's just name that. Hopefully, hopefully that's not true with my brothers. I think I go to confession to Dominicans and I have good experiences, but you know better than I do. This is a good time to talk to friends and be like, okay, who do you go to? Who do I not go to? Who's in the middle, okay? Who's a yellow light? Who's a green light? Who's a red light, essentially, okay? Some priests talk way too much. Some priests don't talk at all. Some priests are just right. Father Goldilocks. And sometimes it's just, the priest is in a mood, right? We hear confessions before dinner, and I'm a man, so sometimes I'm like, I just want to eat. So, like, to our fathers, go, right? As best as possible, don't interrupt the priest. You only make him talk longer, okay? If you find a priest's counsel unhelpful, again, ask other Catholics what priest you should go to. If you think a priest says something misleading, oh, that's not a sin, and then talk to someone you trust, whether that was a sin or not, right? Um, okay, and then the next section here. So sometimes in this part, the priest has to ask you to clarify or correct something. So these are the things not to do. These are the potholes that make confession really awkward. So if you confess mortal sin without a number, the priest has to ask you to give a number. And again, it's just going to be awkward. because so they say, well, did it happen 10 times? You're like, 10 times, Father? Right? Did it happen just once? You're like, oh, it happened lots more than once. Right? There's just so many ways it can go wrong. Right? Or if you... Confess a mortal sin, but only vaguely, but we've already talked about that. One possible one, I hope it doesn't happen that often, is if you imply a mortal sin, but didn't actually confess it, right? So if you're sorry for not making the bed after doing something with your girlfriend, it's like, you're sorry about not making the bed, but like, were you sorry about the other thing, you know? And this does happen, so like, just, right? If you confess a sin of stealing, the priest has to make you do repayment of some sort. That's kind of rare, but just be ready for that, right? I give you all the things that are going in the priest's... I want... I give you this list so you know what's going on in the, in the priest's head, okay? So, yeah, you can read that if you ever steal something. This is what the priest is thinking. The other two ones, please never do. These are any reference to a lack of contrition for a sin or any reference to a lack of purpose of amendment, right? So just the way <laughs> in certain parts of culture... If you, there are certain statements, if you say to a teacher, she has to call in, like, if you say something about, like, suicide, the teacher can't joke with that. They have to call it in to, like, higher authorities. 
If you say anything about not really being sorry or not really wanting to change, the priest can't laugh about that. And now you're, you've now gone into like detention mode rather than friend mode. So like, don't do this to the priest. So like, just be sorry for your sins and change and don't even reference anything on the other side, okay? Those are all potholes. The next is penance, as you, again, you are all pros here. So usually, at least Dominicans, at least the ones I go to, you usually give penances you can do in 30 seconds or less. One Hail Mary, three Hail Marys, five Hail Marys, one Memorare. Those are the ones I usually get. So I don't know if my, no, my, no, my sins need confession. Um, some priests can ask you for things you don't know, especially if you're new. Like, this is something I wrote for RCAA. So like, if a priest asks you to do like the litany to St. Padre Pio, you know, like, what litany is that? Like, you can tell the priest, I don't know what you're talking about. He also can give you something very vague, right? Think about God's mercy today. It's like, okay, I don't have OCD, but I have a little bit. So, like, can you tell me, like, what the beginning and end of this penance is, right? Um, be more thankful, right? So you can ask the priest, Father, that's a great thing. Could you give me, like, a, a more concrete penance? So you can ask the priest for a new penance, right? Obviously, be nice about it because you don't want him to, like, double up on you, um, right? Also, doing your penance is not required to be forgiven, right? So when the absolution happens, your sins are forgiven. If you are sitting there thinking, I'm not going to do this penance, you may have some other problems, right? But sa the sacrament works. The usual thing is that you forget what happened and then you forget to do the penance. Like, the sins are forgiven. Or you realize afterwards, like, whoa, that's a really intense penance. Like, one time I received the penance of going to bed at 10 a.m. for five days in a row, which for me was a big, like, oh my gosh, like, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to make that happen? Right, so if I didn't get to, if I got to bed at 10.05, it's not like all my sins come back to me, right? Like, your sins are forgiven, and then the penance is this extra you do to God, for God. Also, just be aware that um, we should be doing a whole life of penance. So if the priest says, pray to our fathers, it's not like saying, okay, if I do to our fathers, I'm good for the rest of my life, right? It's like, do the to our fathers, and then abstain from meat on Fridays. Like, you should be, still be living a full Catholic life with penance, right? So finding your own penances. Um, so don't limit yourself just to what the priest says, okay? So again, prayer, fasting, almsgiving are not just for Lent, okay? Then comes the priest's absolution, right? So this is when Christ forgives you. If the priest fumbles the words... As long as he gets the general meaning right and doesn't do anything really weird with it, it works. So a common thing you will hear, some priests will say, I absolve you f from your sins, and if I absolve you of your sins. So sometimes the prepositions change, still works. I absolve you from all your sins, that still works, right? If the priest says, I forgive you in the name of Jesus, then you say, Father, thank you so much. Could you please use the words of absolution, right? And if you don't know the words of absolution, here they are, okay? Um, I give you, there's a whole, um, if you go to EWTN, there is a page, Missing or Faulty Forms of Absolution, which gives you a lot more details about this. Hopefully, you never have to experience this, and hopefully, if you do experience this, you never go back there ever again. This is just not something, this is really awkward for you to have to, like, say, Father, could you be a priest, right? So um, that's another reason to talk to people about where the red lights are and where the green lights are, if that makes sense. Okay. The concluding dialogue, this is something most second graders never learn, and some of you may already know it, some of you may not know it, but the priest should say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, and the response is, his mercy endures forever. Now, there's lots of different translations. His steadfast love endures forever, his love endures forever, all these different translations. But most Catholics don't know this. Um, so, and most priests just presume you don't know it, so they may not actually say the first half. 
But if the priest does say the first half, just jump on in and say, his love endures forever, his mercy endures forever, his love is everlasting, something in that ballpark, and that's going to be good. Yep. Again, it's not necessary, but it's really powerful and very beautiful. And then the priest has two options. He has the short option, Lord, I free you from your sins, go in peace, or sometimes just simply go in peace, um, or the longer option. Um, I say this, don't tell the priest what option to choose. That's his choice. But don't walk out of the confessional when he's still blessing you. There are some, sometimes I'm giving a blessing, they say, thanks, Father, and they, it's like, okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. Good. So, and note on the seal of confession, hopefully you all know about this, right? But priests, the specific thing, a priest cannot reveal a specific sin with a specific sinner. Right? So I can say generally that sometimes people in Manhattan um, are upset with slow people driving. Right? That's like, okay, that doesn't really reveal. But if I say, do you know that, you know, Mrs. So-and-so gets upset at Mr. So-and-so when this happens? That, I would be in big trouble, okay? So that's like the specific thing a priest can't do. But most priests don't even get close to that, and they avoid saying anything general to anything else. So we try to keep things very general and vague and funny and like changing details, if we even do it, right? So please don't encourage priests to say what happens. That's like a little bit of a social faux pas, right? Just so you know, if a priest does directly break the seal, so linking a particular sin to a particular penitent, he is immediately excommunicated and he can only be forgiven by the Pope or the Roman Curia, right? And he probably will never have active ministry ever again. So, like, just so you know what the priest is thinking about this. And also, as I already joked about, men don't remember well. So that's not the reason why Jesus Christ only chose men for the Twelve Apostles, but it does kind of help. That, especially, again, here we have meals after. So, like, I'm thinking about food in about 15 minutes, and those of you who live with men know that like men just think about food, right? So I will, even if I wanted to, I'm just gonna be thinking about potatoes, right? So um, go to go to confession before the priest goes to dinner, and you're golden, okay? A much more important question: If I keep confessing the same thing, does that mean that confession doesn't work? First of all, all of us are thinking. All of us have this experience, like join the club. Most of us are not that inventive with our sins, right? So the first thing, just keep going to confession. That's the practical takeaway here, right? Uh, if you're repeating the same sins, give thanks to God that your sins are not becoming worse, right? Because sins want to become worse, right? So like, if you ever have seen a garden that just never gets weeded, you don't just have denny lines. You have like big bushes that start growing of like weird stuff, right? So if you just are struggling with the same dandelions every week, give thanks that you don't have like a big poisonous bush killing your whole garden, okay? Second is maybe Jesus wants to make it clear to you that he loves you even when you're a mess. He's the better person in the relationship, and he wants you to accept that. He wants you to believe that he never tires of forgiving you. Perhaps Jesus is keeping you from greater and deadlier sins. So one hypothesis I have is that as humans, we feel much more guilt about sins that involve our body. Sex, alcohol, food. We just feel guilty. It's like, oh, I can't believe that. Whereas sins that involve just our souls, pride, envy, vainglory, we not only don't feel shame about those, we think we're right about those. And that's really deadly. And so, and this is just from Romans chapter 1, sometimes if we're going to hell because of pride, God allows us to commit a sin that involves sex, alcohol, or food because it'll make us feel shame and get us to go to confession. So sometimes it's a wake-up call that God's like, oh, if, if now if God doesn't doesn't will you to sin, but he withholds his protection against certain sins, because he just, he just knows it's going to be more dangerous if, if they don't, I don't know, 
there's a, there's a weird theological thing here, but just sometimes it's actually better for you to go to confession and you just make sure that, like, it happens, if that makes sense, right? I don't want to say that God wills you to sin, but sometimes he's aware that you need to go to confession, and so he's going to withhold some support to let things happen. If you read Romans chapter 1, then you'll see it. Romans chapter 1 around like verse 20 and 26. Especially in June in New York City, you'll see some things there. Also, this is just part of how sins work. Sins are habit forming, right? So it's just like part of how our sins work. And also too, um, think of all of your confessions as dress rehearsals for your deathbed confession. And I'd much rather be in the place of saying, like if I'm on my deathbed and one of the Dominicans is visiting me, Father, forgive me for I have sinned, it's been a week, and it's the same old sins. I'd much rather have that confession than like, Father, like, oh, it's been 30 years. I think I'm a good person. Um, I probably did some things wrong. Like, that's all I can really think about, right? Especially because like my mental capacity is gonna be really low while I'm on my deathbed. So I'd much rather be used to having really boring confessions than like sort of avoid it and then have a really vague, unhelpful confession at the end, right? So if you're always confessing the same sin, you're going to have a really easy deathbed confession. It's going to be the same old thing, Father. Okay? I also give you a video from Father Mike Schmitz confessing the same sins over and over again. A couple of misconceptions. Some think that confession is an inconvenience to a priest. Uh, please don't think this. Some priests will let you know this, which is a, a shame, but please know that any priest who's a friend of Jesus Christ shares in that Luke 15 joy of Christ, and we're glad you came. Okay? So please don't apologize for going to confession. Just apologize for your sins. Okay? Some think that the holier one gets the less they will need to go to confession. Most saints went to confession like once a week. Thomas Aquinas went once a day. I think Mother Teresa went one a day. Now, th like, those can be for weird reasons if you go too often, but um, it's actually a good sign if you go regularly. Okay? I give you four simple ideas to level up your next confessions. Going frequently, going to the same priest, seeking direction outside of confession, and then going to mass or adoration after confession. Okay. If you give me 10 more minutes, we'll get through this, okay? So I want to alert you to at least three common dynamics after confession. There could be more, but think these are three big ones. The first, God wants to bless you. He wants to give you such good things, right? He wants to give you that fatted calf. He wants you to have a party. He wants to rejoice with you. So after confession, to open your heart to his goodness. I give you this little anecdote. Pope Francis went to confession as a college kid on September 21st, St. Matthew's feast day. And after he left confessional, he said, I should be a priest, right? It was just a grace given to him because he went to confession and God was like, oh, I love you so much. Here's a grace, right? And so just be ready for, to receive a grace that is disproportionate to what just happened. God just gives good things, and especially when you're in the state of grace and you've just been forgiven, you're particularly receptive to his goodness. So just let him, like, let him be an Italian hostess, give you more pasta than you need. Let him give you that kind of love, okay? The second, which is a little bit strange, is that God will draw you into greater sorrow, but holy sorrow, Think about the prodigal son. The prodigal son is sorry for his sins mainly because he's hungry and thirsty. He comes back and says, Father, please forgive me so I can eat food, essentially. Then when he's at the party, this is just my imagination, I imagine that there's a point at the party where he realizes, my dad's a good man. And I just really, um, how do you say this without using a swear word? I messed it up. 
I should say I'm sorry to him, not just because I'm hungry, because I wasted half his inheritance, and he's very generous. That's a deeper kind of sorrow, a sorrow that comes from love. And so be ready for this. God is going to love you so much in forgiving you and forgiving me that I'm going to realize, whoa, you're my friend, and I just did that. And so you've been forgiven, but God wants to perfect your sorrow, make it something holy. Again, he wants you to listen to Stevie Wonder, Sign, Seal, Delivered. He wants you to sing about how much you love him and you'll never go back, right? But at the same time, it doesn't remove the false sorrows, just the sort of self-loathing, fake sorrow, right? It just gives you good sorrow. The final thing, which sounds weird, is that God is going to test you. He's going to allow you to be tempted. Remember that after Christ's baptism, the Holy Spirit drives him into the desert to be tempted. And so if the Holy Spirit drives Jesus into the desert to be tempted, and you want to follow Jesus, he may drive you into the desert to be tempted. Not because he wants you to sin, but he wants to give you the chance of punching the enemy right in the face, right? He wants to give you the grace you need to go back, face the same battle, and choose the right option by his grace. I give you these two quotes, Hebrews 12, the whole chapter is good. Endure trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating us as children. What child is there whom a parent does not discipline? Or from Sirach. My child, when you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for testing. Set your heart aright and be steadfast. and Do not be impetuous in time of calamity. I give you here, I think, six really common temptations that happen after confession. First, God didn't really forgive you. Second, and I, I give you the responses. I think they're straightforward enough. God forgave you, but soon enough you'll sin again. You're always going to be a sinner. Right? To Satan, God, I belong to you. I belong to you not to sin. Or the tempter will say, look, you're still being tempted. Your confession did nothing. Right? Give up all you hope, all you who enter here. You're still stuck with me. It's no good going back to God. He abandons you so quickly. Right? Or the tempter will say, go ahead and avoid sin, but you'll be miserable. You'll miss me. Or the tempter will say, sin is fun. Confession is free. So why not sin more and then go back to confession? We've all fallen for that several times. Or sort of like the last hope temptation is, I get it, I get it, but how about just one more sin, a fun one, and then I'll leave you alone, I promise. And we can laugh because we fall for that one, right? So just be ready for those temptations and to know that you, it doesn't mean that your, your confession didn't work, or that God doesn't love you, or that you're just all, you're going to hell and there's no help, but that God just wants you to show your strength. Right? He's your father, and he's going to win the battle for you, but he likes to see his children do well, too. So he tests you. He allows you to be expanded. Right? So not, to not be like, oh, everything's going wrong because I'm being tempted. It's like, no, God's just treating you as children. Good. I want to end with two simple stories, just to sort of bring it all together. So first is one you know very well when Jesus reconciles Simon Peter at the side of the sea, right? He had denied Jesus Christ three times by a charcoal fire, and now he confesses his love three times by a charcoal fire. I want this to sort of help you understand confession from Jesus' standpoint. First, Jesus initiates. Jesus finds Peter. So when you go to confession... Certainly your feet brought you there on one level, but on a deeper level, the good shepherd picked you up and brought you home. To really believe that Jesus Christ is initiating the sacrament. Secondly, Jesus gives Peter breakfast first. 
that's just like it shows you how much he understands us, that we need to have food before we have an intense conversation, but also how much he loves you. So even before you've been forgiven, he wants to make you breakfast, right? Jesus asks for Peter's love. He doesn't scold him. What were you thinking? He doesn't shame him. What kind of disciple are you? He just asks him to get back to loving as friends. When you come to confession, Jesus doesn't say, I can't believe you did that. He just says, are you ready to love me now? Let's just get back to loving each other. Jesus also restores Peter to his vocation. Right? He doesn't hire him, doesn't, doesn't fire him. He doesn't pick out a new apostle to be the head. He just gets him, he says, like, okay, get back to tame the sheep now. Let's do it. In the same way, whatever vocation you have, when you sin, it's a serious thing, but God restores you to your vocation. Okay? Jesus also gets Peter ready for his martyrdom. <laughs> right? So a little bit of a twist there. But, but Jesus, when he gives you, when he blesses you in confession, he knows your destiny, and he's giving you the grace you need to accomplish it. And the final thing is that Jesus calls Peter to follow me. Right? Jesus wants to bring you closer to him when he forgives you. And then if you will allow me, I want to end with Therese. You probably figured out that Therese is behind every homily I've given, and so now finally at the end, I'm like, here's the great reveal. Here's what was behind all the homilies. So... So Therese kept correspondence with this young, young seminarian slash priest, Maurice. And Maurice knew that Therese was about to die, and so he writes this letter to her. He says, I fear that Jesus will tell you all the sorrows I have caused him, all my misery, and that your tenderness will grow cold. If only you knew how miserable I am. This has to be, at his first words, close his lips, for without you I cannot stand up. Right? I want, I, if I could speak French, I would put in French, because that'd be so much more miserable, right? It'd be like so excruciating to hear Maurice. Um, yeah. And then Therese, this is the biggest rebuke I've ever seen in her writings. She says, dear little brother, you must know me only imperfectly to fear that a detailed account of your faults may diminish the tenderness I have for your soul. At that point, she won me for my whole life. I was like, okay, Therese, we can be friends. Oh, brother, believe it. I shall have no need to place my hand on the lips of Jesus. He has forgotten your infidelities now for a long time. Only your desires for perfection are present to give joy to his heart. So first, just to note here, if this is true about Therese, it's true about all saints, it's true about all saintly people, and it's true especially about God that a detailed account of all of my sins would not diminish the love that Therese has for me, the love that St. Vincent Ferrer has for me, all the saints, the love that God has for me, and even the, the love that saintly people have. That sin does not, like, dirty diapers don't make you love your kids less. You're just like, let's clean this up and I love you, right? And then having that confidence that a detailed account of our sins does not make saints turn away from us, let alone God himself. Now, Therese does balance this out. She says that those who are near Jesus but are never repentant for their sins in a way cause him great pain. Metaphorical, but like something real there. But then she says, regarding those who love him and who come after each indelicacy to ask pardon by throwing themselves into his arms, Jesus is thrilled with joy. To really believe that, my brothers and sisters, if you come each time and throw yourself into his arms, you give him great joy. And that's not metaphorical joy, that's real joy. And she, she concludes here, it is true to enjoy these treasures, one must humble oneself, recognize one's nothingness, and that that is what many souls do not want to do. But little brother, 
that's not the way you act. That's a very charming way to put it, Therese. So the way of simple and loving confidence is really made for you. Let's end with a prayer. In the, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, your love for us is so great. You are rich in mercy. Father, you rejoice to forgive us. Father, you restore the truth of who we are. Father, you are praiseworthy. May all of our sins, when we repent, may they all give you praise, for they show the greatness of your love, a love that you manifest through your saints, through your church. We ask you, Father, to raise up holy priests to hear confessions, holy priests that will have a heart after the shepherd himself to rejoice and to restore. We ask you, Father, <clears throat> to give us strength against all the temptations that keep us from going to confession and all the potholes before and after. That in all things you would be glorified. That you would fill us with faith in your love and your mercy. And that we would make that mercy known to this world. We pray especially for those who doubt the mercy of God in our world, who think somehow that God will punish them with, with cruelty or with malice, who see the Catholic Church as a problem and not as a source of mercy. Father, renew your church, for certainly there are problems. But Father, may the truth of the mercy of confession draw all peoples to you, that they would know the love of the Good Shepherd that they would taste the great feast of the fatted calf that awaits all those who come to you. Father, run after us, carry us in your arms, and lead us all to you, all for the praise of your glory. And my brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.